Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be introducing the second method to find uh, shear and moment diagrams, shear and moment diagrams by integration. We'll be discussing the integral relationships between load, shear, and moment, uh, and looking at some of the peculiarities that arise out of sign convention, as well as looking at a few basic examples of finding shear and moment diagrams and functions by integration. So, as a reminder, the topic for today is shear and moment diagrams via integration. And as we discussed, there are three primary methods of getting shear and moment diagrams or shear and moment functions. So, methods for VNM diagrams, or just methods for VNM. As a review, there are three primary methods we're going to discuss in this course. And these are one um, by uh, sections, which we've already discussed. And the next one, which we'll be working on today, is by integration. Applying the integral relationships between uh, load, shear, and moment. And then three, uh, by inspection. Inspection is simultaneously the quickest way to get a diagram while also, in some ways, the trickiest. So let's take a look at, so again, um, for today, our topic is primarily by integration. And we're going to be applying the uh, derivative and integral relationships between shear and moment in this process. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at that. Okay. So... As you may, recall, may or may not recall from statics class, there are some um, there are some relationships between uh, shear moment and uh, distributed load, and uh, these need to be uh, well. First of all, uh, in order to define those, we should first review our uh, sign convention. First of all, for uh, load. The way I'm going to define uh, load, shear, and moment, uh, the integrals of load, shear, and moment, is I'm going to have a positive load as downward. So a uh, downward load is positive, and the reason for this, of course, is just uh, you know it's just convenience and uh, you know standard sign convention. And the reason we, as civil engineers and structural engineers, usually use this as positive load is because. Uh, most of our loads, uh, most of our vertical loads anyway, do act downward on structures. If you think of dead load, if you think of live load, uh, these rarely have ever act upwards. And so these are, so we define a downward external load uh, as positive. Then we also have shear, a positive shear. Remember a positive shear is represented by a downward arrow on the right hand side of an element and an upward arrow, or an upward arrow on the left-hand side of an element. And then moment. A positive moment will be represented by the type of moment that causes something to enter um, positive bending or positive curvature, like so. And that's a review from previous videos, or from previous lectures. All right, so let us now look at uh, the relationships between load, shear, and moment that we can apply uh, for integration. V and M by integration. So uh, if you have, I maybe I could say something like this. If you have W as a function of X, where x is along the length of the beam, I can say the change in shear between two points, say between a and b, is equal to the integral, and specifically the negative integral, of w of x dx between a and b. And also, the change in moment between points a and b is equal to the integral from a to b of the shear of x as a function of x integrated over that interval. 
So let's discuss uh, what this actually represents. And uh, really to get a feel for this, we need to uh, review a few of our calculus concepts. So let's take a look at that. And I've, uh, now you probably could phrase these a little simpler, but I specifically phrase them the way I do um, to really illustrate the idea that, that, uh, that fundamentally while the integral relationship does apply, it's not as straightforward as simply taking the integral of say a polynomial. There's some other subtleties that we need to be aware of. And let's take a look at that. So we have, we know that uh, load is that the that uh, shear is the integral of load, and that moment is the integral of shear. So let's say you have something like this. Let's look at maybe I'll call this section of applications. So we know that load is the function. Of, uh, we know that shear is the function of load, and that moment is the is the uh, integral of shear. I should say and that shear is the integral of load. But uh, there are some subtleties therein. And so uh, let's take a look at this. So let's look at, say, a sim just a simply, sup let's look at the simplest case. A simply supported beam. And let's say this thing has a, oh, let's say this thing has a load of three kips per foot. So w as a function of x is just equal to 3. And oh, let, I don't know, let's say this thing has a, low, has a length of, oh, maybe 20 feet. So we would go, as, in, as we integrated on this beam, we would go from x equals 0 on the left end to x equals 20 feet on the right end. So let's try to find uh, shear. Now, often you'll see v as a function of x is equal to the integral of, uh, the negative integral of w of x dx. And that is correct. Um, and that is fine. But this is, uh, if you look at the, these carefully, we have here an indefinite integral. And here we have a definite integral. And uh, this, these are really just written this way to emphasize the fundamental theorem of calculus. And what this really comes down to is this. Let's see what happens when I take the integral of this. Well, I have, I have uh, just a, a w of x is simply equal to 3 kips per foot. So the integral of that is simply going to be negative 3x. Or is it? Well, the integral, as we recall, as we uh, learn in fundamental calculus, uh, when we take the integral of something, we also have to add a constant. And that is our plus b. Our, our infamous plus b or plus c or whatever, whatever you might want to call it. And so we have this... Uh, we have this constant of integration that pops up whenever we take the integral of something. And uh, shear and moment are no exception. When you take the integral of load, you end up with shear, you, you do end up with shear, but you have to have your boundary conditions. You need to know something about uh, the shear, well, we, we refer to them as boundary conditions, but effectively, you need to know the shear and moment at, or you need to know uh, some boundary conditions in order to solve for the shear and moment as complete functions. And so how can we do that? Well, think about this for a second. If you have, and so maybe I'll uh, go ahead and maybe I'll write this over here. So we, again, we need to find uh, some sort of way of doing, of figuring out boundary conditions. And for statically determinate beams, that's actually not too bad. It's usually not too bad for statically determinate beams anyway. So let's take a look. 
So let's say you have a beam. So let's actually look at this beam here a bit. Uh, boundary conditions for V and M. Let's see what type of boundary conditions we can use. Well, if you have a simply supported beam, think about the if you have a load like this. If you have a load, some sort of load function across it, uh, you can go and calculate the reactions, and maybe these would be AY and BY. Now, in a shear diagram, uh, that AY right at the left-hand side of the beam is going to cause the uh, shear diagram to, in to have an initial value equal to AY. And so you can think of it as the, uh, one way to think of it is, the, is, as, the, uh, is as the boundary condition causing, uh, or as the reaction causing the uh, shear diagram to jump up to a value equal to AY right at the left-hand side of the beam. Then we're going to have a, a function that slowly, uh, because this is downward load, the shear is slowly going to increase you know, uh, across the entire length of the beam. And then we'll end up with a negative value down here at the right-hand side of the beam at which point BY will cause it to jump up. So at the left-hand side of the, so I, um, just by solving for the reactions, even before I get the shear and moment diagram, I know some boundary conditions that I can use. I know, for example, that uh, V of zero is equal to AY, and V, oh, that should be V of zero, not V of X. V of zero is equal to AY, and V of L, or whatever the coordinate is for the left hand, for the sorry, right hand side of the beam, that would be equal to BY. All right, so those are those. That's an example of the a type of boundary condition you could use. Also, if you knew this was a symmetric beam uh, with a perfectly uniform load, you could even say that the uh, that the uh, shear in the center was zero. If you wanted to apply arguments based on symmetry. Then we have similar boundary conditions for moment. Um, so if you have moment, uh, let's say you have a, another simply supported beam. Now your moment diagram might look something like this. Very common. But at a pin reaction or at, at a pin support or a roller support, I know that the moment has to be zero. So at any pin support or roller support, At a pin or roller support, M will be equal to zero. And we can use that as a boundary condition. Or if you have a, uh, a fixed beam, a cantilever beam, well, you can solve for, by applying just static equilibrium, you can solve for, say, the moment at A, and then use that as your boundary condition. And you can simply use that as your boundary condition, although you'd have to apply a negative here uh, to, for, uh, to balance between internal moment and external moment. And I think this will make more sense as we look at some examples. Okay, but anyway, let's, work, let's look, continue working through this one here. So again, we need some sort, of, uh, yeah, some sort of constant here. And to do that, I want to, I should go ahead and get the reactions. And for a simply supported beam like this, it's not too bad. I can just say, okay, well, this is symmetric uniform load. So the total load on this is 20 feet times three kips per foot. That is 60 kips divided by two, that is 30 kips. So uh, not too bad. So we have reactions of 30 kips on both sides. So I have, uh, and maybe I like to use this uh, system of saying like C1, C2, et cetera, for my just different constants of integration. So I'll, I'll just call this one C1, and I know a boundary condition I can use now is V at X equals zero must equal 30 kips. So I can simply substitute this relationship into my shear equation here. And so let's see, I will have uh, 30 kips equals negative three uh, times zero plus C1 which leads us to C1 being equal to 30. So therefore, V as a function of X for this beam uh, is then going to be equal to, uh, let's see, that would just be negative 3X, or sorry, negative 3X plus 30. 
if I can manage to math that correctly. And we can check that by saying, okay, well, if I put x equals zero into this, I will get a shear of 30, which is what we expect according to this. And if I put in x equals 20, well, 20 times negative 3 is negative 60, plus 30 is negative 30. So we end up with a negative 30 at by, which again is, that, is exactly what we expect. Uh, then I can do something similar. I'm Actually, I'm going to do the moment over here, I think. I want to go ahead and get the moment function as well. And we can do that. Just, I will leave this portion here so we can look at those boundary conditions. Or so we can reference those boundary conditions. All right, so let's see. So we have we now have v of x or v shear as a function of x, and that again is negative three x plus thirty. So I now know that m as a function of x is equal to uh, the integral of shear as a function of x dx. Okay, so if you remember how to integrate a polynomial, and that would be negative 3 halves x squared plus 30x. Uh, and then we'll have another constant of integration, rc2 here, rc2. And so we need to apply a boundary condition. And our boundary condition is going to be that uh, because this is a simply supported beam, with a pin and a roller at each end, uh, I know that the that because the endpoints, because our pins and rollers are incapable of supporting any moment, I know that the moment at each end has to come to zero. So my boundary condition is that m at x equals zero is just zero. So that's not too bad. So I can that makes things nice and easy. So then if I put in um, negative three halves times 0 squared plus 30 times 0, you can probably see where this is going, plus c2, and c2 equals 0. Therefore, our m as a function of x is simply equal to uh, this equation without the constant, negative 3 halves x squared plus 30x. And if I wanted to actually, so I now have my shear function, and my, I now have my complete shear function and my complete moment function. And if I want to create shear and moment diagrams, all I have to do is plot those equations. And I trust you know how to plot an equation. So, uh, questions so far? Okay, so hopefully not too bad. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, erase this and then we'll go, uh, we'll start looking at a, uh, another example and discussing some other uh, subtleties uh, involved with shear and moment diagrams by integration. All right.
All right, so let's take a look now and consider more shear moment diagrams by integration. So, uh, one, some other subtleties. There's two other things I'd like to mention just qualitatively. Uh, one is uh, further calculus relationships. Maybe I'll just call this for further calc stuff. Um, so, there's a few things. Now, um, think about how I first wrote these. V is a function of x, or maybe v from a to b, change it, I wrote, actually, if I remember correctly, I wrote it as v uh, from a to b, delta v from a to b. So delta v from a to b is equal to the negative integral of w of x dx from a to b. And why did I write that? Why did I particularly, in particular, write this, write it this way? Well, the reason I wrote it this way is because, um, is to really emphasize the idea of the constant of integration, because the integral of fundamentally the integral of load will not give you shear. The integral of load gives you the change in shear between two points. Of load produces the change in shear. change in shear between two points. And this is really just an expression of the fundamental theorem, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Again, um, it will simply tell you the change in shear between two points, and in order to get the actual full shear function, you're going to need to apply that boundary condition. You need to apply boundary conditions. All right. Then, um, let's say you have uh, also one other thing with the shear function. Notice this negative. So this negative is interesting. Um, the negative is actually there just uh, now. I wish I could give you some incredibly uh, elegant calculus or uh, physics-based definition for why the negative ari uh, arises there. Um, but ultimately, that negative is there to make our sign convention work. Uh, by convention, we again have w pointing downward is positive. And if you want to do that, along with all of our uh, positive shear, positive moment that we've discussed previously, you need a negative on your shear there in order to make the math work. So uh, there's no profound, deep, cosmic, uh, uh, mathematic, sublime beauty uh, that uh, there is no fundamental be uh, sublime principle for why that, that negative arises. It simply is there to make the, uh, the math work. Anyway, uh, and then also the same kind of thing applies on the moment, except there is no negative on the moment uh, equation. That simply arises out of, uh, again, out of, we don't need the negative to make the math work there. Okay, and the same sort of thing applies here. Uh, the integral of shear from A to B does not give you a, a moment the integral produces the change in moment between two, between two points. Uh, produces a change in M between two points. Okay. So uh, let's look at a different example. And I might want to look at how we would handle something like a cantilever beam. So consider something like a cantilever beam. And this will give us some clues of how to handle uh, external versus internal moment and such. So let's say we have a cantilever beam and maybe in lovely orange here. And let's go ahead and put a, a load of, oh, I don't know, 
We'll do another uniform load of maybe Oh, let's say five kips per foot and a length of 10 feet. Now I'll need to solve for my reactions first. This is a statically determinate beam, so getting the reactions isn't gonna to be too difficult. I'll go ahead and just call this end A and this end B. And I will say that, uh, okay, so in terms of reactions, there could be an AX force on here if we had any horizontal forces, but they're not, so I'm just, but there aren't, so I'm just going to say there is a AY and an MA here. And an MA. Um, all right, so then I want to do just a summation to get the reactions. I'll do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, and that will be negative five kips per foot times the moment arm length of 10 feet uh, plus AY, and all of this equals zero. And so AY, simply enough, is just 50 kips. No surprises there. And then summation of moments, and I'm going to do the summation of moments at A, counterclockwise positive, and so we'll have uh, MA, MA, the reaction MA, um, and then, and that would be clockwise, uh, counterclockwise about point A, so therefore positive, and then minus five kips per foot, the equivalent point load is gonna be 50 kips times 10 feet, times a moment arm length of five feet. So that will co then come to, uh, and this all equals zero because we're in static equilibrium. So MA then is just going to be equal to uh, 250 kip feet. However, I'd I then need to go and turn these into boundary conditions. So we need to think about this. Now, the shear is gonna be fairly straightforward. The shear, uh, for the shear, we will actually uh, pop up right at the start. That vertical load will cause the shear to initially pop up. So I, uh, at to a value of 50 kips. So V at zero is going to be equal to 50 kips. However, M is gonna be a little bit uh, more interesting. See, I might be tempted to say that M at zero is 250 kips, but uh, from but think about what, what I know about curvature. I know this beam, Think it's going to be bending like that. this, it's going to be bending downward like this. So I know this beam is gonna be bending in negative curvature, even without doing any math at all, because this is a, a fixed beam or a cantilever beam, I know that this is going to be in negative curvature. So really the moment should be negative throughout its uh, length. And so uh, we then need to think about, okay, how does this make sense then? How can I get uh, MA is equal to, how can I use that MA to get a boundary condition? Well, this, uh, if we look at the moment diagram, uh, when we apply the boundary condition of shear, at that point on the left-hand side, it does just pop right up to the value of the moment, but that's because there is that negative um, there, there is this negative within the uh, shear function, within the shear uh, load integral relationship. By default, we would expect the internal forces to be opposite in direction, uh, opposite in sign to the external forces. And so these reactions really are external forces. And by default, we would expect the internal forces to be the opposite. Now, um, for the shear, we have the negative. So the opposite of the opposite is the same. We end up with 50 kips. So on, for shear, on the left-hand side, it is simply equal to the reaction on a simply supported beam. But um, with moment, if you have, a, um, if you have a, a point force or a point moment, in other words, at this location, we're going to have a, uh, basically a 250 kip foot uh, point moment applied to the beam. And so while that is a positive moment externally, Internally, in order to resist that moment, we are going to immediately drop down to negative 250. And that will, uh, in turn, make the math work. So a boundary condition for this beam, for the moment, is going to be that M 
at zero is equal to negative 250 kip feet. My moment at zero is going to be equal to negative 250 kip feet. Okay, so I'm going to erase this board and continue working through this example, and we'll see how that would uh, work out. So, uh, again, we have our uh, we have our reactions, and we also on this beam know that uh, W is a function of x. So for um, again, I'm continuing this problem, looking at my reactions, or looking. I have my reactions. I've used those to get boundary conditions, and now I can go and apply my integral relationships. So for this problem, W as a function of x is relatively simple at just five kips per foot. So it's just five. Um, kips per foot. And you, of course, could work all the way through these with the units if you wanted to. Um, so then, shear as a function of x is going to be equal to the negative integral of load as a function of x dx. And, uh, well, the integral of a constant is just, uh, of course, is just negative, is just 5x or just 5 times the constant, or just x times the constant if I'm talking generally. So the integral of that is going to be negative 5x plus a constant of integration, which I will refer to as c1 because it's the first constant of this problem. Now, I need a boundary condition. And for the shear, again, this isn't going to be too bad. My boundary condition is going to be that uh, v at x equals 0 is equal to uh, 50 kips. v at x equals 0 must be equal to 50 kips. And so uh, then I can say, um, so I can just substitute that in, 50 kips is equal to negative 5 times 0 plus C1. So C1 is just equal to 50. Or shear as a function of x then is equal to negative 5x plus 50. Simple enough. And uh, interestingly, what if I were to look at what if I were to use the other side of the beam as the uh, as the uh, boundary condition? Well, if you think about it, the shear at the far end of the beam has to be zero. It is a free end, and any free end will have to have uh, zero shear and zero moment because there's nowhere for that moment to go. There's nowhere for that shear force to go. If you have a free end, it's just hanging out there in the air. And so if there's nowhere for it to go, well, you can't have forces applied to a beam with nothing to balance them out. Otherwise, the beam's going to start moving, which is generally a bad thing. So another boundary I could use is I could say V at 10 is equal to zero. So let's think about what that would look like. I would put a uh, 10 in here for X and a zero over here. And when I solve for C1, I would get the same uh, 50 kips. So it doesn't matter, uh, as long as you set things up correctly, it doesn't matter where you choose your um, your known points, now uh, your boundary conditions. Now I wouldn't by default know the shear at the center of the beam, but I do know the shear at the ends by static, uh, just by basic statics, static equilibrium and uh, definition of, of free ends and such. But whether I choose this end or this end is my boundary condition, as long as I set up properly, it shouldn't matter. So then, um, let's go ahead and get the m, the moment. The moment as a function of x is going to be the integral of uh, uh, v as a function of x dx, which will be, let's see, that will be negative 5 halves x squared plus 50x uh, plus a c2. And I know, again, I have a boundary condition that the moment 
at x equals 0 is going to be negative 250. So let me go ahead and write this out. A boundary condition I can use is m at x equals 0 is negative 250, applying what I discussed previously here. So negative 250, all of these x terms will just go to 0, so that's just going to be equal to c2. So c2 is equal to 200, negative 250, and so therefore m as a function of x is negative 5 halves x squared plus 50x minus 250. And if you were, and you can plot that, and that would be a just a relatively simple uh, concave down parabola with a, with a uh, zero moment at the far end. Well, actually, we can do, let's double check that actually. So, um, if you know a thing about beams, you can actually go and double check your results just by applying your other boundary conditions. So I know that, again, at a free end of this cantilever beam, that the shear and moment have to be equal to zero. So I can use that as a method of checking my work. So let's take a look at that. So I, do, I would like to just go ahead and check that. So again, I know that at x equals 10 feet at the right end, at the right hand side of the beam, uh, we should have a zero uh, for our moment. Uh, let's see, so there is that. Negative five x, yeah, we're looking good. Okay, so let's go ahead and get an m at 10 feet. Let's see what that looks like. That is negative 5 halves times 10 squared plus 50 uh, minus 250. Oh, that should be 50x. Sorry about that. That should be a 50x there. I apparently can't integrate properly. Uh, so that's 50 times 10 and then minus 250. So let's see. That is negative 5 halves times 100. Uh, that is going to be plus 500 minus 250. That will then be, uh, let's see, negative 250 for this because that becomes 500 divided by 2 is 250 plus 500 minus 250. And indeed, as expected, that collapses down to zero. And again, how I knew that was because this is a, can a 10 foot long cantilever beam. And at the far end, at the free end, a cantilever beam should have a zero shear and zero moment, simply because there is nothing to balance out the internal shear and internal moment, so it has to be a zero at a free end. Okay, questions on this problem? Ah, okay, so the question is, uh, when I solve for the boundary condition at A, uh, for, I first solve for the reactions, um, how did I know that it was going to be negative? Okay, so let's review that again. How did I know to flip it around? Well, by default, I would expect external forces to be opposite internal forces. So I knew that, uh, again, when I solve for the static reactions, just the reactions from statics of this beam, I got that the moment was equal, MA was equal to 250 kip feet, right? Well, make sure I have my right number. Uh, yes, okay. So, but, but it's important to keep in mind what this number represents. This number represents an external force. This represents the, and 
Uh, this 250 kip foot represents the external moment that must be applied to the left-hand side of this beam in order to keep this whole thing in static equilibrium. But this is an external force, not an internal force. And so by default, uh, external forces are equal and opposite to internal forces. Um, and it's kind of, and the, the same is true for shear, except we have that negative on the integral in order to balance out the math. And so uh, basically, if you have a shear, if you have a reaction like Ay, for example, what's going to happen with your shear function is that it's going to, if this is like your zero line, um, shear is going to pop up start off at a positive value of Ay on, say, like a simply supported beam. Um, but then moment, and so by def because we are plotting internal forces here again, by default, I would expect the, uh, you know, inter I would almost expect shear to be negative at that point because I have an upward force, I would expect an equal and opposite downward force. But uh, again, to make the math work on our sign conventions, we apply a negative. So positive point forces cause positive jumps in shear, while uh, positive moment, external moments, cause negative jumps in moment. And I think maybe I'll actually, you know, I think that that deserves its own section. Uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, elaborate on this by writing this out a bit more. I think that could actually use its own uh, written section. This is, I'm glad you asked that. That's actually very good. This is always a common sticking point because it is tricky. It's hard to get your head around it. Especially when you start adding arbitrary rules like, oh, you have to have a negative to make the math work. And again, I wish there wasn't so, such arbitrary rules, but such is just kind of the nature of uh, sign conventions. When you ch choose a certain thing as positive and a certain thing as negative, you, un you end up with uh, mathematical pledges like that sometimes. Euler's identity, this is not. Okay, so in terms of external versus internal reactions or forces, So a um, a pos for shear a positive point force or reaction or maybe I should say not positive but upward an upward. Uh, point force or reaction will yield a upward jump in V diagram and vice versa. So if you have a reaction, say here's your beam, say you have a beam like this with P, a point load P, and reactions P over two and P over two. What does that shear diagram look like? Well, here there are no distributed loads. I just said this would be a simply supported beam with a uh, point load P in the middle and reactions P over two on both sides. Well, our shear diagram is going to initially, again, cause a upward point force or reaction causes an upward jump in the V diagram. So this thing is going to immediately jump upward P over two. And there are no, there's no load between, uh, between our reaction and our center at this, uh, at this point on this diagram, on this beam. So it's going to remain constant. Then we will, uh, then an external uh, force P will cause this thing to drop down uh, a value equal to the force that, that is being applied. And so if, we're, so if we're starting at P over two and we're dropping down P, that will move us to negative P over two. 
and then it'll remain, then there's no more loads between uh, the center and the, the right end. So it will remain constant until we get to the, to the uh, rightmost reaction, the rightmost support, at which point we'll this upward point force will cause an upward jump in the shear diagram, bringing us back to zero. So for shear, it's fairly straightforward. Upward loads mean your shear diagram jumps upward, or upward loads or reactions cause an upward uh, jump in the shear diagram, and downward loads and reactions cause a downward jump in the shear diagram. But it gets a little trickier when we get to moment, as we've seen. Uh, the, in the case of moment, because we don't have that negative in our sign convention, we just apply them as, uh, uh, we have to apply them opposite. Or you can, another way to think of this is on the uh, shear, we sort of apply a double negative, and that's what produces the direct, direct positive equals positive relationship. So let's look at moment then. And this is almost getting into some of the uh, this is almost getting into some of the topics of solving shear and moment diagrams by the method of inspection, but we'll be looking at that uh, later. So here, uh, then, for moment, let's think about moment. Let's think about moment for a moment. If I can manage to spell the word moment properly. Okay, for moments, a uh, a clockwise, or maybe I'll say a counterclockwise, or maybe I'll just say positive counterclockwise. A point moment or reaction uh, will cause a negative jump in the shear diagram, or sorry, in the, in the moment diagram. So uh, if you have a reaction, so if you have a, again, if you have like a fixed beam and if you have a load on this, if you have a load uh, downward on this, you're going to want a, so let's say you have a load like this. Actually, let me go ahead and I'll put some numbers on this. Let's, or just some values on this. Let's say this was P and length L. I've been tending to use capital L, at least a capital L. Um, and length L. Well, it's fairly easy to see by statics that you would end up with a uh, a counterclockwise or positive moment of, of uh, M equals PL. We would have a moment equal to PL on this. Fairly simple. However, in our shear diagram, again, we know, or sorry, in our moment diagram, we know that because this beam is going to be in negative curvature, we should expect a negative moment. And so, um, again, here, we have a positive counterclockwise point moment or reaction on the left-hand side of the beam. So for our moment diagram, we're going to immediately drop down uh, to negative PL. And because we have no, uh, we have no loads or actually no shear, uh, well, actually we would just have a, no, we would have shear, but uh, what this would end up looking like is just a linear function going to zero, but you can run through the integral to see that. Okay, so uh, again, we have a positive external moment, and that's going to cause a negative immediate jump in the moment diagram. And that even works for internal moments, like a, a, a point moment applied internal to a beam. And I'm going to illustrate that through uh, one more example.
All right, so let's look at what happens if we have a, a point moment. And let's say we have a beam. And I'll just do a simply supported beam this time. And let's say we have a, um, I'm going to apply at the center a positive couple equal to say, oh, I don't know, 100 kip feet. And let's say this beam is uh, 10 feet long. So this beam is 10 feet long. Now, I'm going to need some reactions. And this is going to be a little bit interesting because uh, this external moment is going to want to cause this entire beam to uh, rotate in the counterclockwise direction. That means I'm going to need to set up forces in the opposite direction, basically set up a couple in the opposite direction in order to balance it. So uh, let's see, again, that wants to go this way. So I need to set something up like this here. And I could just apply basic uh, knowledge of couples by saying four separated by a distance. These have to each be equal to 10 kips. A 10 kip, uh, two 10 kip, a, a set of 10 kip forces separated by a distance of 10 feet will generate a moment of uh, 10 kips. Or sorry, generate a moment of 10, of 100 kip feet. So my V diagram uh, will initially, uh, initially applying, oh, just applying the rules we've seen, uh, we have a 10 kip reaction on the right hand side. And so because uh, positive jumps in shear cause positive jumps in moment, my uh, 10 kip, my reaction uh, is going to cause my shear diagram to initially jump up uh, 10. So I'll have 10 here. Then I have no load. I have no distributed load between uh, the left hand side and the center. So the, uh, so the shear is going to remain constant. And in fact, this a moment doesn't generate any direct force, so it's not going to generate any change in the shear by itself. So the shear is actually just going to be a constant 10 all the way across. And then we get to the, when we get to the right hand side, we're at positive 10, and then this left or this right more uh, reaction of uh, 10 kips downward will cause the shear to jump downward 10 kips as well. Now moment. Let's think about moment. M say in kip feet here. Well, um, let's see. So the um, the change, so the integral of shear is going to be the change uh, the change in moment. And so uh, one way to think of this is that uh, this is like a shear. This is like a shear of v of x equals ten. So uh, our shear, our, our our moment function should be some sort of positive function, like a a ten x or something like that. Um, but let's think about this. So, um, now without, uh, get, so what's going to happen with the moment is we're going to start at zero because the boundary condition, the, the moment at zero is zero. The moment on the left-hand side is zero because it's a pin support. So our, uh, our moment is going to go upward like this, uh, sort of with the function, uh, M of x equals 10x. This is going to have a slope of 10. And then we're going to drop down. Uh, this point moment is going to cause a drop. Um, this peak, this will have a peak value of 50, and this will be down at negative 50. And then this will go back up again with a slope m of x is equal to 50. Or sorry, m of x equals 10x. So again, with a slope of 10. So uh, this, again, this is kind of blending into our discussion that will this kind of blending into a discussion of uh, solving via inspection that we'll look at next time. But uh, the key thing that I really wanted to illustrate is this is what the moment diagram would look like. And so notice we have a positive external moment on here, and that causes in the moment diagram a drop in the moment at the location where the couple is applied. So, um, if you, uh, so there's, I know that was a very long winded way of answering the question. In short, the way we handle it is, uh, shear causes, uh, point, shear, point forces like reactions and point forces, uh, positive point forces and reactions cause positive jumps in shear, 
while in moment it is the opposite. If you have a positive moment or a counterclockwise moment applied to the exter applied externally to a beam, the moment diagram will have a drop at that location. So shear uh, load goes with shear in terms of internal and external, but with moment, internal is opposite of external. Hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy, as they're supposed to say, etc. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, feel free to let me know if you have any questions or reach out to me by email. Um, and uh, regardless, hope you found this useful. Hope you found this a little enjoyable. Well, enjoyable by certain definitions. Uh, it depends if you like math or not. But uh, anyway, again, today in this video, we looked at uh, finding shear and moment diagrams by integration exploring the uh, integral and derivative relationships between shear and moment, and going into depth about uh, some of the uh, intricacies and complexities and uh, potential foibles of finding uh, boundary conditions and the, uh, the issues with uh, sign convention as we have explored. So again, feel free to uh, ask any questions in the comments below. Uh, regardless, I will hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.